Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. It's another episode of Perspective, and of course, it's that time of year, exam time, and I think it's a very, very stressful time for parents. Um, and I'm so glad that I'm way, way beyond all of that. When I think of what parents these days have to sit with regarding the raising and the supporting of their children, we didn't do that back in the day. But alhamdulillah, I guess with every generation, um, we are faced with unique and different problems uh, regarding that particular generation. So when I say it's that time of year, end of the year, around the corner, holiday time, but right now we have to focus on exams. And I kind of wonder, is it the children, our learners that are going through more stress than the actual parents? Um, just what goes through the parents' mind this time of the year. So to try and unpack all of that and get our children exam ready, in studio we have an occupational therapist um, with a speciality in dyslexia and literacy and she is here to talk to us about that very important subject and that of course is exam readiness. Her name is Amira Hendricks. She is also the OT at uh, Pinnacle College in Linden in Johannesburg and she's going to talk a little bit about her work and then we'll go into exam readiness. Assalamu alaikum Amira, welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, you're a mom, you're a mom of three children, three girls at that. They're spaced apart regarding their ages. You've got a tween, she's 12 years old and that of course is Sephora. Then you have a seven-year-old, Sarah, and you have a five-year-old, Hannah. Yes. And totally different personalities. Does that then indicate, Amira, that their learning styles are also totally different? Definitely. Each child comes with their own challenges, and each child has a different need and learning style. So it doesn't mean they're sisters. They have the same ways. They definitely all need separate attention and I need to give them what they need on their levels. Must be exhausting. It is exhausting, <laughs> especially if you have your own job still. Of course. Are you able to be objective? You're an occupational therapist and you're going to talk a little bit about your work just now. What exactly is it that you do and how you help children? But just to digress, um, are you able to be objective when you need to work with your own children? Uh, no. There's a a fine line between being mom and OT at home and it is really difficult to not assess my own kids at home and just dive into helping them. Um, I'm always assessing them and then I'm always panicking that maybe they're not meeting levels. Um, so it is really difficult to draw the line between OT and mom. Does that make you somewhat of a helicopter mom? Um, not as much. I think because I have, I'm not going to say so many, but uh, three kids is, is more than it's a handful. Yeah, it's a handful. <laughs> so I think it doesn't give me the time to be a helicopter mom because I have work, so my kids at work, they're also my children, and then my own children. So I don't have time to helicopter each child. My main goal, um, and if you see my kids, I try and teach independence from a young age so that I don't have to be next to them and guiding them at all stages. So only when they need me. Alhamdulillah. You are a pediatric OT and you are based at a school in Linden. Uh, Pinnacle College is uh, the name of the school. Uh, let's understand what type of work you do there. But before we get there, what is, you know, when people in the past spoke about OTs, I kind of just um, blanketed OTs uh, in one colour, so to speak, right. that they work right across the board. But you sitting here with me this morning and our off-air discussions were pretty interesting. Uh, and you say that you're a paediatric OT, so are you suggesting there are many different types of specialities within um, occupational therapy and why? Okay, so definitely there's like, you, there's, you know, such a vast um, spectrum of, of disabilities that 
each therapist specializes after university in that field. So not even, you don't need to go study to become a, a specialist in the field, you can. Um, but there's pediatric, there's hand therapy, I'm just gonna name a few. You can go into adult neuro, so that's your stroke patients. Um, there's adult rehab, so physical rehab, so car accidents. Um, so, and then there's medical legal as well. So that's going into the law field, um, insurance. So it's quite a vast um, area where you can cover in OT. In university, it touches on all aspects and it's up to you afterwards to then try and specialize in the field you want to be in. Why did you choose pediatric OT? Was it because you knew you're going to be a mom and perhaps it will make you a more hands-on mom or you'd be able to support your kids uh, more fully than if you kind of chose another spectrum of OT? So when we were choosing community service um, hospitals, we basically chose what was closest to us and more convenient. So. I got placed at Rima Musa, and that's a, ch a woman and child hospital. And I was then in the field of pediatrics, right? And I learned the skill um, through another therapist that was already there. And I fell in love with the, the pediatric setting. They did put me in hands for a bit. I went to Helen Joseph to work on hands, and it definitely wasn't for me. I got a bit queasy because you have to open wounds, you have to dress them, you have to clean them. So I stuck to pediatric OT, but on the side, I was also doing medical legal. So I got into the medical legal practice as well. So I had a bit of both at one point and I slowly phased out medical legal and now I'm fully pediatric. What is medical legal? What type of work are you involved in as a therapist in that field of OT? So we worked with Road Accident Fund. So clients that um, were in an accident, or even medical negligence incidences, they come to you by a lawyer and you assess them, their functionality, return to work, um, all the occupations at home. So when you speak about occupational therapy, it means ADLs, activities of daily living, basically. So how do they dress? How do they eat? Can they get to work? Can they drive? How, how much uh, assistance do they require at home? So you assess all of that, you write a thorough report of like 20 pages, and you submit it to the law, um, the law firm. And then it goes to court to see how much um, the client can get from Road Accident Fund. Okay, there's been a, a lot of talk about the Road Accident Fund and lawyers claiming uh, yeah. regarding accidents, etc. So we are hearing there's a lot of fraud happening in that uh, area. But of course, that's not what we're talking about yeah, here this morning. Yeah. We're talking pediatric OT. We're talking uh, exam readiness, which we will start uh, focusing on in our next segment. But let's just look more deeply into OT. Um, the moment I saw that you're a pediatric OT, I thought newborn babies and toddlers and infants, etc. What type of work would you be involved in regarding those little patients in your life? Okay, so there's a lot of input from OTs in terms of neonatal care. So touch, um, swaddling, kangaroo, the kangaroo care was started up uh, with an OT at Rima Musa. Um, it's a lot of sensory aspects basically that needs to be done with the little ones and then meeting milestones. So play, bringing hands to midline, etc. How would you or other medical professionals, health professionals, obviously realize that this little infant or toddler needs some sort of OT intervention? And then you, how would you do that assessment? How would you pick up that there's a need here for this child to get some therapy? So, you know, unfortunately, if the moms are not aware, then it does take a while to get a referral because the mom's not aware of milestones that need to be met. And generally when they go to a pediatrician, the pediatrician will pick it up because they're educated in the field. So they'd pick up a child's not rolling at a certain stage, a child's not crawling, or they pick up a few discrepancies and that's when they refer to OT. And then we do a thorough assessment on um, joint mobility, reflex integration, sensory input, um, and milestones to see where is uh, the issues and a lot of times we also look at background so 
why is the child prem? Um, what was the birthing um, scenario? The, uh, how was the mom feeling? Is the dad involved? So all of that plays a part in a child's progress and a, chi a child's milestones, meeting the milestones. If there was trauma at birth, um, if it was very difficult for mom to birth this child, yeah. would that have an impact on the child's um, progression and development going forward? So it does have an impact, but I must also tell you, um, a mom's emotion while pregnant is so important. Um, I've noticed that what a mom goes through actually reflects upon each child. So the feelings a mom was going through while pregnant um, is definitely the child's personality that you see afterwards. Oh. And it's just important to realize that, that you've also had a, a role to play in your child. Okay, we're going for our first ad break. We are talking with occupational therapist Amira Hendricks. We're here to talk about exam readiness, but I just thought I'll sketch a scenario with Amira regarding OT. What does it mean? And let's unpack it a little bit. I've learned a lot in this first segment. I hope you have too. But when we come back, we're going to focus on exam readiness because that's what it's all about. We write in the middle of that time of year where we need to be in the right headspace to make sure that our little ones are calm, collected and ready and rearing to go for the exams. <laughs> Welcome back. We are talking exam readiness with my guest, Amira Hendricks. She's an occupational therapist and she works at Pinnacle College in Linden, Johannesburg. Exam readiness, how much stress does it put on parents and children? And I guess, where does the ability to study stem from? And how do you as a parent get into the right space to prepare your kids for exam time without stressing them out? Because I think that's a huge factor. Definitely. So from what I've seen um, and what I've experienced, uh, study skills stem from routine at home. So you need to have structure and routine within your every day as a parent in order for your child to learn the skills. So that starts as young as five, six years old when they're starting school to know this is the time you need to wake up, brush teeth. So routine is your first basis. And then study skills is definitely, it falls on the parent first. So initially from grade four, you have to teach your child a skill. It doesn't come naturally. So a child is unaware of their abilities or how to learn. So you first have to teach them um, okay, we're first going to read through everything, we're going to do this, then second we're going to do this. So you actually have to be by their side quite a bit and allocate a lot of your time to teaching them the skill. And that comes with its own challenges with each child. So with each child, a child that has focus issues, it's not going to be that easy because you're going to get complaints, you're going to get reluctance to learn. So it's easy to have a child, and I know girls are a bit more easy in terms of willing to sit down and learn than boys are. So it definitely falls on the parents initially to teach a child a skill and then it will get easier later from grade six, seven. Amira, let's, you spoke about focus and immediately what comes to mind is ADD and ADHD. Yes. How huge a, of a problem is that in this day and age? And what is your role as an OT regarding those issues? Because surely it has a huge impact when it's exam time. Right, so a lot of our referrals are ADD and ADHD, and some diagnosed, some undiagnosed. Lots of parents don't want to label their kids, so they don't go for the diagnosis option, but this definitely impacts on study skills. As OTs, we don't actually need a label, right? That's my opinion, as, as my, in my OT practice, we don't need to label kids, because you are treating symptoms. So, so what do you tell the kids? Because I seem to remember way back in the day uh, when I was taking my youngest son for um, a bit of coaching and, you know, uh, play therapy. He hated the thought of that. He said, everyone's going to laugh at me and think that I'm stupid. And he really pushed back on that issue. 
Do you find you get that with certain children? How do you deal with it? You know, that stems from home nowadays because therapy has be become so common in our society that children see it as a time out from class, especially at school. I have another practice in Emerentia where they come after school and they see that as playtime. So it definitely stems from home and society that puts that uh, barrier on them, that says, well, you have a problem if you're going for therapy. If you don't put that on a child from home or from uh, people around them, they're not going to know any better. They're going to see it as playtime, especially OT. There's swings, there's toys, there's games. It's not seen as a negative experience unless that was told to them or a child from another family has teased them or said something. So I'm finding that therapy is more common nowadays and not... Um, seen as a negative. And children are more accepting of 100%. play therapy. I think teachers have a huge role to play here as well. Uh, back in the day when I was growing up, teachers were not very uh, sensitive to children, how they take comments and remarks. That can be very damaging for a child because a teacher could be comparing you with either your sibling or someone else in the class and not realizing they're creating so much of damage as 100%. far as the child is concerned. So in the foundation years, it's really important to have a well-trained teacher that understands children and understands the emotionality around it. And also to pick up on difficulties and address it early, early intervention. So um, definitely a highly skilled teacher is important for your foundation years, grade R, grade one, grade two, and grade three. We talk about exam readiness, and I've just thrown something at you regarding the ADD, ADHD child. Mm. Then you also have the child who has very poor uh, self-esteem or a poor image of him or herself. How are you able to identify all of that and then get them and prepare them to be exam ready and to be focused on their daily tasks at school? So by the time exam comes around, they're more than ready. Right. So. We work like with self-esteem especially, we work hand in hand with play therapy. So that's to eliminate any issues underlying any trauma and understand why a child has self-esteem issues. So that would be more on play therapy, um, so we would refer. But when it comes to exam time, these type of kids you would need to start early. At the school I'm at, they usually send through um, a timetable at the beginning of term, first day you get a breakdown of what assessments they are, what tests they are, and that's when you need to sit with your child and highlight in their diary. It's important to have a diary. Um, Even little children. So the little ones from grade four should have a diary. So little ones don't really do tests and exams. Grade one, grade two, grade three, they do continuous assessment at our school. So it's not as stressful, right, because they're too little. So from grade four, they start doing more cycle tests and more assessments and projects. All that has to be jotted down in a diary so the child is aware. However, that being said, you also need to bring awareness to the diary at grade four level because they could forget it in their bag for days and not even look at it. So even a calendar at home. And then that's why I said parents have to come in and make kids aware. It must be that much more difficult working with a child that has issues that we've touched on now, um, poor self-esteem, ADD, etc. You as the OT at the school will be doing your part in taking the child to where you want him or her to be. But what's the role of the parent? Where and how do they come in and how do you engage with them to continue the engagement at home with the child? So it definitely works hand in hand. I can't be implementing structure in our therapy sessions and it's not carried over. So we always give homework to the mom and dad. It would be nice that everybody carries out, but remember in this day and age, moms and dads both work. So it becomes really difficult. We try and then get the input from helpers to actually carry it through at home. So we always tell parents, give us the number of the domestic or your helper or a nanny that can assist. And then um, we go through them. But basically, from home, what needs to be done is diet, time management, and then if any blood work needs to be done. Because a lot of times you see fatigue, and it's not just because 
a child is tired from the extramurals, it could be an iron issue, it could be a diet issue. So parents need to be aware of this and not take offence when a therapist says, you know what, we need to check the diet. Sugar nowadays is playing a major role with focus and concentration. Nutella sandwiches at school, snacks, children have free while at the tuck shop. That's a big, big issue. They're going with their tuck cards and they're tapping for whatever at first break. It's Coke, it's chocolates. Let me interrupt you here. Yeah. The school then needs to take responsibility and supply nutritious, well-balanced snacks for the kids at break time. Why are, the why are the schools failing in that very important area? Because the kids obviously, um, after break time, they're probably very hyperactive because they've, as you've indicated, uh, sugary cool drinks, uh, chips, chocolates, etc. Yeah. And I think the school and parents need to work hand in hand. And we know yeah. the school is dependent on those funds, but um, they're not doing the child any favours, neither are they doing the teacher any favours by that because those kids are going to be disruptive in the classroom. Yes, unfortunately, and children don't have the self-restraint, um, especially grade three, four, five. They just want the sugar. It's, it's an addiction. So the older grade kids, we can teach them the skill, but yes, it would be nice if schools could implement healthy snacks or sell them um, the chocolates and cold drinks after second break, right? You can still have it there, but maybe limit it um, at first break. Um, the Tuck Shop card at Pinnacle has restrictions. So as a parent, you can go onto the app and you can say, don't allow my child A, B, and C. And that really does help because once they tap it, it appears on the screen and then the person serving them can say, well, your mom said you're not allowed cold drink, you're only allowed juice. So that does help, but a lot of schools should be implementing healthy snacks. Okay, uh, we're here to talk about exam readiness, but of course talking with our OT in studio this morning, Amira Hendricks, um, there's just so much more to getting to this point of exam readiness. Mom and dad has to be on the same page as teacher. The sports structure back home is of vital importance, obviously. Then, of course, um, our OT, Amira Hendricks, has just talked about um, our diets. Our diets are all wrong. And back in the day when I was growing up, you had a sweet or a chocolate or a treat once a week. And now our kids are indulging every single day. So that's something that parents need to be very cognizant of and start adjusting the children's diets and how much of tuck money they give to the children. But more coming up right after this ad break, we are going to continue exam ready for our children. It's exam time. So let's get them ready. <laughs> Exam readiness is what we're talking about on the show this morning. Welcome back. Hope that you're enjoying the discussion with our guest, occupational therapist Amira Hendricks. She works at the Pinnacle College in Linden and she's here to share some of her expertise with us on exam readiness. I think all of this is underpinned, Amira, by different learning styles. I mean, you have three daughters and even though they're in different age brackets, I should imagine their personalities would impact on their learning styles as well and vastly different. 100%. So um, usually what I'm seeing, especially in my own kids, the children with focus difficulties are usually your kind of aesthetic learners. So they need movement, they fidgety, they need sound. Um, to focus, um, so they, that's their learning style, right? And then you have, you know, the, the children that always are writing notes and highlighting and write, rewriting the whole textbook. They're your visual learners, right? With them, you have to focus a lot on time management because writing the whole textbook down is not ideal, right? And then you get your auditory learners. Those are your really bright kids that can sit in class and listen to a teacher and actually just learn from that. Wow. So they don't have to go back. So they're the learners where the parents are, quite, are, are often shouting, why aren't you studying? 
but they actually absorbed everything in school ah, already. Okay. So for them, they just need to read and revise. Right. Like I'm sure one of your children were like that. <laughs> so yes. um, my middle one, is, is she's definitely like that. So That's Sarah. Yes. So Sarah is definitely, from what I can tell, and she's only in grade one. So I'm not going to pinpoint it right now, but she's going to be more of an auditory learner because when she listens to a program or when she listens to something on the radio, she absorbs it and she can tell you, she can retell the story to you in different words and different ways. And she, she learns from it. So same in class, she can tell you exactly what the teacher said. That being, she's lazy then to read at home because she doesn't have to read the instructions because she heard it verbally and she can redo the, the, the task at home without reading it. So Amira, how does this impact on both in the home environment and in the classroom? Because we've now touched on something very important that there are different learning styles and you're going to have a class of 15 or 20 children and uh, you're going to put them in three different categories as you've just right. explained to us now. How does the teacher cope? How does the teacher identify how she needs to interact with each child? And does it create any sort of stigma from one group to the other? So it's really nice at our school, uh, we run study skills every term at the school for the different grades that need it. And we've identified which grades need it more. So during that study skills, I do the assessment with them in the groups. And each child is so fascinated by the questions I ask and like, wow, I didn't know that, that I'm this type of learner. And then usually I tell them to group up with similar learners, not their friends, because lots of times the friends don't have the same learning style. And that distracts from and that, their learning. Yes, because now you're trying to learn like your friend, but your learning styles are different. So I say, look in your class, who has the same learning style? Pick up your hands, who's a visual learner? Who's an auditory? Group with those kids during study time and you can all formulate a plan together because you are learning in the same way. You do one set of notes, you do one set of notes and we combine it. So you're going to save on time and you are going to learn in the same way. So it's going to be more effective. The kinesthetic learners, they movement learners. So I said, go to the playground, kick a ball around together while you are throwing notes around. Um, those type of learners also need foods that are crunchy, um, chewing gum is so good for them because it's movement in the mouth. So they're getting some sort of sensory input while learning. So those are the kids that are chewing, eating crisps the whole time while they're studying. They're pacing up and down at home while they're learning. So they can also form a group. And then your auditory learners, is, it's, all, it's a discussion. So you would, they can sit down and discuss with each other the topics and learn from each other. So one can take one subject, one can take another, and they can teach each other in that way, in an auditory setting. So at Pinnacle, a lot of the times, it's already instilled in them from grade four what type of learner you are. You can be a combination. That being said, you can be a combination. We found it in kids. So you could be an auditory learner with kinesthetic. You need to see then and learn which one is your strong point and move towards that and add in aspects of the other part to your learning. Is this information shared with parents? So if they bring, if they ask you to assess their child and to give them all of this type of information, if you share it with them and they then work with you and their child, how much easier do they make the child's learning life going forward? Oh, that would be really effective because then if a parent knows, and a lot of times parents do ask me to help their children with study skills, it's part and parcel of OT. So then we let the parent know, this is the way your child learns, this is what you need to do for them at home. For instance, um, a, a visual child, or actually any child, with memory difficulties, past papers are so important. So I would always tell parents, they need to study the content beforehand, at least three days before the paper, you need to print out past papers with answers. Let them work through the past papers. See what the style is of the questions, how to answer it. As a parent, you're going to have to guide them. When they ask a how question, when they ask a what question, when you see mark allocation, what happens then? If you see two marks, you can't put one point. So we teach parents a skill as well at home to, to assist their kids with past papers and bringing it forward. 
We're talking about your experience at Pinnacle and you being an OT. Undoubtedly, you really do work together with your children. Um, as you've indicated, they're all three very, very different at different ages and stages of their lives as well. How difficult, or how challenging is that? And what do you want parents to understand from your experience as an OT? You're one of the fortunate people because you're an OT and you can give and get the best out of your children in the way you interact with them and in the way you support your children at home. So what are so, the challenges that parents need to watch so out I'll first for? tell you what's the challenges for myself as an OT. I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm still a mom. And because I have all my other kiddies at the practice, I could give a lot of time to them as well. By the time I get home, I'm exhausted because I'm human. So being an OT is all good and well, but sometimes it also, you fall short with your own kids. But the advice I can give you is, you need to plan ahead. When you have children at different ages, you need to understand what their timetable looks like. So food, I had a test today, she actually has two, um, English as well as Fik and Madresa. So you have to give her time from Sunday and schedule time in for her to study. So what does that say about her? What type of a learner is she? So she's a kind of aesthetic learner. Okay. So in terms of her, I cannot take away her sport. So sport is really important for her to continue to learn. She needs the break with sport in order to move. So she's a swimmer. So she swims three times a week and despite having two papers, she has to go for her swimming. So we need to filter around sleep, hygiene as well as sport so we need to understand that that's what she needs as a person and I have to honor it because if I don't she does fall apart if I don't give her movement then she cannot focus and then with that I do um, give vitamins as well because she does have focus difficulties so I, I supplement her during exam time what sort with of vitamins, vitamins would those so it's be? over the counter like with her I use Neurovance um, I use um, I uh, equizine, so it's your fish oils, and what I do is I alternate. So we, when I'm using Neurovance, I only use Neurovance. When it's done, I move to equizine, and then I move next to Neurovance, so your body, body doesn't become too used to it. With Sarah, she's grade one. The main goal there as a mom is that I make sure she reads, because your reading is of utmost importance for all subjects. So at that level, um, I need to be there and sit next to her and read. So that time I have to give to Sarah. She's in grade one. I have to space out the time and make sure my other children are busy with their own stuff while I focus on Sarah. She's a very independent child, so it's easy for her to say, don't worry about me, I've got this. But her personality does show that she does need my time. So I offer her my time. Hannah at this point is at Montessori. So she gets what she needs at school but at home, most of the time, she is doing her own arts and crafts. Uh, what I noticed with her is she is more socially and emotionally um, immature uh, compared to the rest of my kids because she's the baby of our family. So in terms of her, I try and support her in that way currently. So emotionally and socially. Rather Simply than because everybody babies her. So 100%. that's what she acts out as well. 100%. And it falters into school. Mm -hmm. She needs... Uh, reassurance from the teacher more, um, socially, um, she needs guidance more with her friends and her peers. So in her phase right now, that's where I'm at. I'm not an ap on an academic level with her. I need to support her emotionally and socially. Um, fascinating indeed. And of course, it's time once again for us to go for our final ad break. We'll come back. And there's so much more that I do want to unpack with you, very especially regarding... Um, comparisons in the home and in the class, how damaging is it and how should you as an OT intervene and how should teachers intervene, but all of that and more right after the ad break. I do hope you're finding this conversation as fascinating as I'm finding it. And um, I've never ever given thought to the role, the huge role and responsibilities an OT plays in the lives of our children at school and back home. So please do uh, join us for the final segment on exam readiness. But it's not only about exam readiness. Post exams and in everyday life, we need to take all of the tips and everything Amira shared with us on the show this morning 
to ensure, alhamdulillah, that we have very well-rounded children. That doesn't mean that they're not going to squabble amongst each other, but make them as independent and as well-rounded as possible. We're wrapping up in our final segment right here on um, the show. We are talking exam readiness and the one very, very crucial factor we need to touch on is assistive technology and to add on to that too much screen time. How is that impact impacting on our children? And we've spoken about different learning styles. Uh, do different children respond differently then to technology and uh, too much screen time? A loaded question, is it not, Amira? Yes, it is. And there's a time and place for screen time. There definitely is. Um, what I've noticed at our school, um, the younger teachers come in with tech, and it actually gets onto the level of our kids nowadays. The old school techniques sometimes do not work for the kids nowadays. So the way they bring it across the learning in terms of videos, music, in the class, actually works for the kids nowadays because they're all on devices. That's the way they learn. They're all technology-based. So um, there is a time and place for it, but um, at home, screen time needs to be limited, especially around exam time. And it can't, cannot be uh, cut off just before it has to be weaned off. <laughs> so you're going to get a lot of arguments if you just do a clean cut it has to be weaned off from the time school starts in the new term, so that by the time you reach exams, there's limits in terms of screen time, and there need to be rules around it at home. So how about assistive technologies to help the child during study time? Um, how will that enhance their exam or study experience? And you also spoke about the different learning styles. So isn't this uh, the type of, you know, depending on technology, the visual learner, won't, won't this truly enhance them and take them to the next level? A hundred percent. So um, what I usually say is prep in the morning what you need to learn for the day, download your videos, stick to not more than five minutes a video because then you start to lose focus. So five minutes needs to be maximum for a video you download. Download them, switch off your Wi-Fi and then you can watch them offline. Reason being, if you're on Wi-Fi and you start scrolling through YouTube videos, you are automatically going to go into a spiral. You're gonna stop watching the relevant content and you're gonna go back into videos that's not school related. So if your Wi-Fi is off and you've downloaded what you needed for the day, that's what you stick to. So you use visual aids and videos to teach techniques. I'm seeing it more with mathematics. Children are really using um, videos to teach them concepts that they didn't understand in class. So teaching them online and they can re-watch it. So your visual learner learns from this. Your auditory learner also learns from videos. What was also um, a technique I, pr I said they could do, but that's given that a school allows cell phones, is to tape record your teacher in class and re-listen to it if you didn't understand a concept. Right. But that would also relate to children in a specific age group. 100%. Those are the, the ones with phones, right? A nice um, uh, aspect that Pinnacle has done for Afrikaans and Zulu, the teacher records um, the colors as well as, say, household goods, and she sends it on your phone via the WhatsApp group, and you can allow your child to listen to it at home and learn from it and several times you don't have to just play it once so you can do it in the car with them so these type of things definitely aid a child however we need to just be mindful of YouTube and scrolling through the wrong content it makes one wonder where technology is taking us to um, I guess it's mixed feelings it's a blessing but it on the other hand could be a curse as well percent so like with iPads um, it's more one-dimensional it's tapping and you're not getting your fine motor skills you're not getting the handwriting in with playing games the old-school way you would you would actually manipulate objects um, there's more perceptual we're seeing that children don't have good problem-solving skills anymore 
because they're not playing their real event games, they're not playing outside. Um, it's more uh, television based. And children are getting irritable more because they don't have um, the pro, uh, they can't prolong uh, waiting because technology is so fast paced. They don't have delay of gratification. So all of this so plays a role. instant gratification 100%. that they want. And that's when it falls short in terms of studying as well. You want to learn one thing and you want to know it. And that's not how it works. You have to retain it in your memory. Does that mean that you have children that have issues with discipline then? And then how do you as an OT come in to correct that? So that's a whole topic on its own. Discipline and technology. There's been a lot of studies that's done that can show how um, certain apps cause aggression in kids. And um, we need to undo this by stopping the technology, it's especially the bright colors on videos, the fast paced, you're constantly changing videos every minute. You're watching children from different countries and they're not very respectful. Um, their ways are different. All of that aids to your child's personality and the way they speak to parents and the way they conduct themselves at school. So all of that needs to come into play. Another thing with technology that's impacting kids is um, the socioeconomic status. Some parents have the affordability to afford iPads and cell phones for their kids, whereas others don't. And that is impacting kids at school as well. So they're not feeling worthy of being in a certain group because they don't have certain items. And that also needs to be touched on because how do you then talk them through something like that? So you need to explain to them uh, of life uh, consequences, like your parents are working, they're providing you with an education, but also schools then play a role by not allowing cell phones. Um, the, also like uniform, uniforms are important for this similar reason. When they're in casual clothing, you can see what people are wearing. So, so schools they become... play... If they wear casual clothing at school and not, not uniforms, they become horribly brand conscious. 100%. And then they start comparing and competing with each other. Yes, and then this filters into bullying. And this filters, it's just like a roller coaster effect. So it all stems from one point and it all needs to be nipped at the school. And I think bullying, as we know, is a show on its own. Yes. Uh, but it does cause severe problems. How do you very quickly as an OT try and deal with it? If a child at school comes to you, and you can pick it up because the child is not behaving in their normal manner. 100%. You can see they're teary, irritable, they're just not happy. How do you try and get it out of so them? So a lot of the times parents notice it first, but they don't want to explain everything to the parents. So parents then request me to see the child. And then once we understand where the problem is stemming from, I usually go to the teacher and let them know so they can tackle it within the class. And at school, they even have an app, I think it's called the Push app, where if you have a cell phone, this is for the older kids, you can actually log a complaint of a certain child on the app without anybody knowing. And it goes directly to the school. Um, for therapy, so we would find it with the little ones and the teacher would tackle it in class to um, get parents in if it's really severe or talk to the class as a whole and not eliminate anybody because some children don't want to be alienated or bullied more because they, they, they told. Um, so that's where it stems from. Sort of OT becomes a safe space in school if there's no counsellors around to, to deal with it. Um, talking about exam readiness, I think the one crucial issue here is we've touched on so many um, various uh, points regarding exam readiness, learning styles, how to deal with them, the type of support we as parents can put in place. And this mustn't happen a day or a week before exam time. It's mm. got to happen uh, way back uh, at the start of the term, as you said, yeah. as is done at your school. Um, coping strategies, how big a role does it play in preparing your child to be exam ready? So you also have to, with the older ones, you have to realize who has anxiety, who has test anxiety, and filter that out to work on those issues separately. So a lot of kids I'm finding nowadays are really on meds for anxiety at a really young age, right? So um, what parents can do is try and use natural remedies first if they're not on anxiety meds already, like prescribed meds. 
They can use natural techniques, teach breathing techniques, the importance of um, like putting in your sport, your sleep hygiene. Do not study up until late and then not get enough sleep because then memory retention is going to be an issue. However, also knowing what time uh, is best for you to learn as a student is important. You can see that with your kids. Do they study best at night? Do they study best early in the morning? So they wake up and they study at 5 a.m. So that's all important in terms of coping. Having a set idea of how you need to learn and how far in advance you need to learn. Setting a timetable, goals. Um, filtering in. It's filtering in your home circumstances. Sometimes parents don't realize our older sibling has to look after the younger sibling during a certain period of time. That takes away from study time. So students need to be aware of any family functions that's coming up in advance, looking after a sibling, helping with certain chores at home. That all needs to be filtered in to have smooth sailing. Finally, Amira, and this is very important, we look at, about, we look at motivational techniques regarding exam prep. I guess it's not only for exam time, it's just in your everyday life that you need some form of motivation. So it's motivation on the one hand and reward on the other, but very, very quickly because I think it's almost wrap up time. Yeah, so motivation is, what I'm finding is you need to have internal motivation. Children that don't have, that lack the internal motivation are falling short and it's falling on parents in older grades. Parents are having to hold up their kids in grades 6 and 7, which is not ideal because you're going to high school. So internal motivation is, is like what you want in life, and that starts from young. Another thing parents are doing is using device time to, to reward studying. If it works in your home, then that's what you're going to have to do. But ideally, that's not what you want. You want them to be motivated to get good marks and understand what their future is going to be like. So instilling that in your kids from young. What do you want in your future? What do you want from this? So this is what you need to reach it. And that's what you need to teach from young. Okay, and that's where we wrap up your very quickly, a very important message to parents watching us this morning, but we've got to be very quick with that. Would be what? Um, please look at your ch children's emotional state, social circumstances, as well as home routine. Most important for studying skills. And please be there for your kids during study time. And all the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for your company. It was a very important discussion uh, regarding the future of the little darlings in our lives. And that, of course, is... Uh, exam ready. Uh, please try not to put too much pressure on them. Be there for them in, 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 in the best way you can and that is just show love, support, unconditional love and support and just let them know that you are there for them right by their sides. And that's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for your company today. Make sure your kids are exam ready. From me, Julie Ali. Till the next time, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you.